Um, um, I haven't been able to look at a lot of the presentation because I have another course ongoing, but yesterday I was present during the talk of Lenora and uh, I saw that there was a lot of talk already about the aspects of, okay, uh, how do you now do this on farm with your tractors, etc. And where uh, one of the interesting statements was that they talked uh, when they looked at setting up their experiments, okay, and also talking with farmers, so what is your uh, mechanization and then so based on the mechanization how do you do your intercropping and I think that is exactly uh, the point that we saw uh, um, a couple of years ago already when I started discussing things with the farm technologist in the university uh, where uh, we find that okay farmers say well we don't have the implements to use intercropping too well and where the implement industry says, well, actually, there's no demand for other tools, so why would we build them? And this is a typical lock-in situation, and I'll elaborate a bit further on, on um, how we are thinking currently that we may um, actually get out of that lock-in. Um, so let me... Um, uh, the question is, we have this mechanized agriculture. This is, uh, say, uh, the most productive uh, agricultural area in uh, in the Netherlands, in the Poles. And uh, where do we want to move from here? Um, and then we could move further into um, larger fields, and that's where, uh, to a large extent, farm economy seems, seems to drive us few crops, uh, large areas, and more uh, homogeneity. We could also take the, the image of, uh, of uh, the intercropping in China and say, well, we could go a different direction. And here at the bottom center, you see, again, to me, a rather homogeneous landscape, although there is intercropping, you could go that direction, you could also move to the left and up to uh, the, the top left into more and more diverse agriculture. And the question is, where do we want to go and how can we go there? And so, so for me, there are major challenges indeed to, to using um, this highly mechanized agriculture as we have it in uh, large parts of the world. Um, then it's relevant to look at what do we see as trends in farm technology. Uh, I don't need to elaborate in this uh, audience very much on what are the potential gains from intercropping, but I'll try to relate that to, but then what does it require to get those gains? And then I see this a spelling error there's the constraints for widespread use of, uh, of intercropping and the challenges that I think research and design should actually pick up on. So those major challenges. Um, we see a trend in mechanization, and this is what I've seen in my uh, lifetime as a child to the left, and this is the by no means the biggest tractor that you can come across, but it was a nice picture to get from the internet. And this is uh, the type of um, sugar beet harvester that I've been seeing uh, four years ago. It is now in the northern uh, parts of France and, and uh, the picture is from Germany. You have these huge machines that are completely geared towards vast areas of single crops which they can then process. Uh, this includes a whole washing bay so that you can wash off the sand and leave it in the field and then uh, ship essentially only the beads to the industry uh, uh, processing. But this comes at a cost and that is compaction we see now as a clearly emerging problem. In the Netherlands, for instance, there's indications that we're talking about between 5 and 10 percent yield losses because of compaction in the same um, areas that I showed, the, the, the most productive areas. So as I mentioned, there is, in my view, a, a lock-in and where you see that based on economic efficiency, it is easier to have a 
high crop uniformity. You specialize on just um, a few crops. You have the machines that go with it. They become larger and larger to actually uh, be more labor uh, effective, which yields the economic efficiency, etc. And this is kind of a spiral up towards larger machines and more homogeneity. It does come at costs. There is, uh, as I indicated, indication that we're we're now losing production capacity because of the the large machinery and the larger plows to undo the compaction, etc. And on the other hand, there is a sustainability issue related to this this uniformity, and that that sustainability issue is then related to too low biodiversity. Uh, loss of pollinators in the landscape, uh, emissions. Uh, we have this big debate now in Europe on, on the nitrogen uh, emissions. And in the end, uh, also, uh, this does not seem to be a very um, attractive um, livelihood. So what we see is is youth pulling out of farming. Yesterday there was a news item in in the Netherlands that actually of people above 55, half do not have um, someone who wants to take up the farm afterwards. So so we're we're seeing their major problems. So we need to actually turn these things around, increase biodiversity. Uh, provide less emissions and a sustainable livelihood. And, and these things are not easy to combine. Uh, so if we then look at what are trends, well, there's two options that we can go for at the moment. We can go for ever larger uh, or smaller and smarter. And, and the pictures at the bottom is how we currently run our intercropping experiments. So a lot of labor. And uh, I don't think that is what necessarily will uh, keep uh, farmers continuing. But there are options to go rather from the, uh, the larger to the smaller and smarter. You see a development in, in uh, smaller robots, uh, single task robots that actually um, could uh, provide an alternative which has less compaction and needs less homogeneity. There's another trend and that's precision agriculture. And this is center pivot systems, large uh, single dose application over large areas. But we see their uh, development into using soil maps, as we see here uh, on the, the left uh, image, and then based on that derive irrigation uh, intensities. And you could do this in uh, on at nozzle level these days. So you could go for the more, much more um, heterogeneous applications. So this is a development where you see that there is a, a tendency to look at can we do precision inputs. But these are very much, uh, how do you call it, targeted at providing at the right time, the right amount in the right place to further homogenize the crop. So it uses a background of heterogeneity in soils and then applies heterogeneous water to actually homogenize the crop. The question is, can we do different things with the same technique? You could also imagine that with such a center pivot system, and the kind of uh, diverse uh, cropping that uh, Lenora was showing of this farm in, uh, in Lo uh, near Lochem, that you could actually then do right time, amount and place for different crops at different sites, as long as you have the vision related to this. Then there is obviously the use of robots where you see, um, and this is, uh, this. let me get the video going. This is an example from Switzerland. Um, where you have uh, an application of uh, of herbicides. So what you see is a precision dosing where the plant is that you don't want. You can reduce the amounts. You can do this with uh, solar panels. Um, you can do this automated, etc. 
But it's interesting to see that it's locked into the idea that, well, you need to use herbicides rather than doing a mechanical action that may actually be as effective in terms of weed control, but would have uh, a full stop of your um, uh, of your herbicide use. So there again, the question is, which directions do we want to take? And obviously this machine is geared towards recognizing a single plant as being the correct one, all the others as being wrong. Well, the moment you want to go for a more uh, heterogeneous uh, crop stand, you will need to look at, can you use the same vision technique but then train robots to understand much more which crops are needed where. And together with GPS, there is options to go there. Then there's another trend, and it's not only in mechanization, but that's uh, the, the, the option to say we have historic data of production on a field, we have models, we have uh, real-time images and the models are for instance both on weather and to make crop grows so you predict weather you can then see what does the crop need at this moment is this then based on weather predictions uh, the best moment to apply a certain amount of nutrients or to apply extra water uh, so you can use actually a lot of uh, big data, so to say, to gear the precision of your agriculture on a single piece of land. And again, we see developments there. The question being, do we want to do this to further homogenize, to control the environment, or do we actually think we can also use this for these much more heterogeneous uh, crops that um, mixed cropping or intercropping would, would be going for? A further development here you see tractors and actually they seem very logical and normal but they are not. They're um, communicating with uh, this uh, system to actually have and if you would, uh, the sun is a bit difficult but if you look at the cabin there's no one in there. There's essentially a robot in there. There's, there's software and hardware in there. And the same for this harvesting tractor. So these are developments where we see, OK, we can make these tractors uh, autonomous. But the question is, why do we stick to tractors if we are looking at autonomous equipment? Could we go for much smaller and dedicated implements? And uh, this is a project that uh, has been ongoing uh, a few years ago, which looked at the options of using swarm robotics. So where you have um, a surveying agent, you uh, have then um, a signaling to other agents that actually can uh, do more targeted surveying close by or uh, that actually can um, uh, how to call it, um, make interventions, do actions as required. Uh, so there is autonomous machines, but we see the options of going for the big machines and make them autonomous or for going for a completely different autonomous set of implants and using uh, these, these, these developing swarm robotics techniques, etc. So if you look at all those developments in the mechanization area and uh, the, the um, uh, software support to farming, then uh, the question becomes now we have gains potentially in, in intercropping, but what, do, do, what is required to make those gains come through? And so we've, we've been seeing uh, in this course this larger production per unit area or uh, as uh, Lenora also indicated, well, maybe we don't need the larger production, but maintain the production while we can have less external inputs. That's an alternative way of looking at it. Both is possible. We can lower pressure of diseases and pests. Uh, we can uh, reduce the, the problems of weeds. Um, and we can create more infield uh, biodiversity. But 
to have those advantages, what we often need, and that's specifically to for a more effective use of resources, is close proximity. Proximity, proximity of the different species. So wide strips of 24 or 36 meters, will they do the trick? Well, maybe for diseases, for pests, maybe, but probably less likely for all kinds of soil dwelling insects, it may be too far off. So we need proximity there maybe, but we definitely need much closer proximity for something like water or, or nutrients. And this was a, a small um, modeling experiment uh, carried out by uh, Pepijn van Noord, uh, who looked at, okay, now in the maize wheat intercrop, and yes, I agree, this is a model crop I would not be most interested in for wide area, but it's a it's a, a useful model because we can we have uh, quite a few data, and there you see that the width of the wheat strip, as indicated here at the bottom, should be um, well less than two meters to get your maximum gain in terms of your length equivalent ratio, and the same thing for your maize. You need to have quite uh, a narrow strip of maize to really get an advantage. So we need close by uh, crops and then you get into the constraints that, that are related to that. Because a lot of these crops are not synchronized in terms of the time of sowing and the time of, of harvesting. And yes, we have been trying to get wheat pea um, synchronized with breeding, etc. But but for a lot of the combinations that we're interested in, it's never going to work. If you want to grow uh, a wheat and a winter, uh, a winter um, vegetable like a cabbage, then you need to have different sowing and harvesting times. So we need machines that are small enough in size to actually do this properly. Um, you also, if you go for use of biocide, you need to look at how can you apply very locally uh, and very targeted so that you don't actually compromise the um, companion crops. But also if you replace it with mechanical treatments, you will probably have different challenges, biological challenges in the different crops and you need to have an implement that is able to uh, mechanically, for instance, uh, treat these differently. Um, at the same time, yes, we could state that uh, we should go back to all uh, planting our own vegetables. And, and I know there's talk about this, and that's nice when you do five square meters, but the moment you really want to feed your family, family for the full time, then I don't think anyone is going to go for the manual labor. So we'll need to consider that it should not increase over current labor use. Um, and what that requires, I think, is that we really do research in redirecting the full technology design process. So so uh, one of the problems is that also our thinking is kind of locked into yeah, 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 but it has to have four wheels, so to say. I haven't anyone think, heard thinking about walking robots, but I could imagine that with that, you could do a much better job for heterogeneous stents. Why not go there? Uh, um, another element that I see at the moment is that we have, uh, it's not a vast amount, but quite a substantial amount of work on intercropping worldwide, if you look at the literature. But I think Lenora is working on the first real intercropping rotation experiment. Uh, and so th there is not um, enough, I think, insights into the crop rotation design where intercropping is, so to say, the basis. So, can we now um, work in this lock-in or do we need to move on out of this? 
Right, so if we if we look at at the trends in mechanization, then we can invest in larger autonomous machines. We can gear precision agriculture to further homogeneity, or we can uh, think about all these techniques as providing more control and overruling or bypassing ecological processes. That is kind of the lock in that we are in. And if we want to break out, we really need to think uh, things over from the bottom, so to say. So technology should be seen as an option to support the desired ecological processes, because not all ecological processes in our agroecosystems are what we want. Diseases are normal processes, but we don't want them. And so can we think of technology as a support rather than as a control? which also means a, a mindset that's much more, um, much less risk averse. Let me put it that way. The precision agriculture, we can also use a lot of the things that are developed there to embrace and support the use of diversity. So rather than aiming for homogeneity, aiming for a desired heterogeneity. And in terms of the autonomous machines, let's think about smaller implements and use swarm robotics, etc., to avoid that a single person needs to command a single machine, so to say. So these are options, I think, to move out. And so if I come back to the, the image that I gave earlier, the lock-in that we are in from, uh, that, that we come from, or that we are in actually, can we go to a new situation that actually uses smaller machines and because we start using them in a large amount, it will become more economically efficient. It is not at the moment. Um, that will then support crop diversity that will generate more insights in what robots we have. So the, the knowledge design and, and implementation chain will actually turn in a different way that will increase our production capacity but definitely also increase the, uh, the the sustainability of our food system and and i think for that we really need to rethink what does research then also need to do that's our task but also and how do we engage with stakeholders on this and if I look at what I missed, and I missed this design of crop rotations, I think that is really a, a research uh, knowledge gap that we have. Uh, what also needs to be thought about is we need to really move much more into high value crops, because to make this work, we'll need to have mixtures that generate money in a farm. So our wheat maize is not the most interesting from that uh, perspective. Um, we need to think in these highly mechanized systems, biotic stresses, if we don't address these, we're out. But we're not going to communicate with stakeholders in a, in a viable way. And we should also continuously think about what are next contested aspects. At the moment you see this nitrogen crisis in Europe, that we need to address as well. Um, what is a major challenge at the moment we see, uh, so weeding robots, they are developed, uh, vision is developed that we may use for, for insect control, etc. But moving bulk without uh, heavy and large implements is a definitely one of the major challenges. Moving in water bulk, uh, we seem to have options. We can throw it onto the field, but we can't use the same kind of implement to throw out the potatoes, so to say. I don't see individual uh, potatoes being harvested by small robots and uh, a lot of uh, movement. Hey, you want to reduce number of movements and still um, yeah, collect heavy uh, products, bulky products. Um, I think that that it's good to look beyond what we have as robotics in agriculture to really look at what is the uh, the robot technology uh, in any other sector. And as I mentioned, base your 
technology design on the support of ecological processes. So much more discussion between uh, agroecologists and uh, implement uh, designers, uh, farm technology groups about what is needed, what are the processes that we want to support, and then think about what are the technology options there and remain labor efficient. Um, so thinking about then uh, what kind of design do we need uh, in the discussion with the farm technology group we came up with, well, you need to kind of have a kind of a symbiotic design where you really work together and that's work together between agroecologists and technologists, but where you also um, work together with uh, farmers, uh, with uh, implement industry, with policy uh, to make sure that we come up with um, the best um, options of moving our agriculture towards more uh, heterogeneity. And that means that we need to have clarity from the agroecology side on what configurations are we thinking of, what species combinations, what does that mean in terms of, of temporal dynamics, temporal heterogeneity, um, what rotations are possible. Um, uh, yesterday, the, we, with uh, the, the work of Lenora, we talked also very briefly, okay, how do you manage your rotation when you have uh, crops at one side, uh, uh, yeah, you have this pixel type of cropping, also single row cropping. Can then the potato move just one place? Or is the root zone then too much in danger of a buildup of, of nematodes? Do we know that? So what is the frequency with which we can return uh, in these settings rather than when you have uh, a whole monoculture? We know about monocultures. We essentially don't know about mixtures a lot. And in this design, we need to uh, be open minded, so really not too confined by what we see as tradition. Again, does it have to have four wheels? I'm not so very sure. Um, and uh, interact with the different people uh, that are in the end um, going to make this work, farmers and implement industry. Thank you. This was as far as I wanted to go.